Did you bring a Bible? Does church bring a Bible to Sunday school? Brian was uh, telling me before church, he was inquiring about a summer camp, a Bible camp. And he called them. And he said, which Bible do you use? And they said, bring whatever you want. So that ain't, that ain't, that ain't where you're going to spend your summer, is it? I didn't think so. Do what? Yeah, still asking. Amen. Keep looking. Uh, because we are talking about things that are false this morning. Second Corinthians 11. Let's pick it up in verse 10. Um, the Bible says, as the truth of Christ is in me. And how is that? How is it that the truth of Christ is in you? It is through his word. Jesus said in John 17, thy word is truth. Uh, in the book of Psalms, uh, David said, uh, thy word is true from the beginning. And every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. So if the Bible was true when David wrote it, the Bible teaches us that there's no corruption that has ever uh, taken hold of the Bible, the Scriptures. Even though all of the, most of the scholars will try to tell you that the Bible has been corrupted over the years, that's not what the Bible says of itself. And, um, and so as the truth of Christ is in me, Paul did not have the original manuscripts of the Old Testament. What he had was copies. Now, one thing that can be said about the Old Testament and the copies of the Old Testament, and this is something that practically all the scholars agree on, is that when it came to copying the Old Testament, the Old Testament scribes did a tremendous job. Their reverence for what they were doing was so great that when a scribe would copy a book out of the Old Testament or a section of the Old Testament, they had some sort of way of determining whether or not there was errors in that. And if his copy had an error of even one letter, that copy was burnt. It was destroyed. It was not allowed to exist if it had an error on it. And so when they discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls, in the, uh, there's a desert called Qumran, and a shepherd boy literally went into a cave and found all these big clay pots, and inside these clay pots were these old documents and when the archaeologists or whoever the historical people went out and examined it they discovered that they had copies of the old testament that were older than anything else we had before that time they go all the way back to the time before christ and when they looked at the copies of the books of the old testament from the dead sea scrolls and compared them with the oldest copies of the Old Testament that we had before then, they found almost no discrepancies between the two, which is, is unusual. When you have handwritten copies, usually there's a mistake shows up somewhere, but they found that they, the copies that we had were almost 100% perfect compared to the older copies that they found in the Dead Sea. And so there, there never was a question about whether or not the words of the Old Testament um, were kept intact. They were. And, and when you compare the King James with modern translations, uh, there are no missing words or verses from the Old Testament. They're all in the New Testament. And it's almost like, there, it's almost like Satan didn't really care about what was written in the Old Testament, he targeted the New Testament. And so what you have is about the same time as the Gospels are being written and Paul's letters are being written and so on, you have people immediately 
taking what they were reading from the apostles and deciding they didn't like it, and so they rewrote it, they copied it, but they left things out that they didn't agree with. And so that's where a lot of the errors and, and a lot of the um, omissions from these new Bibles show up is in these old copies in the New Testament where they decided they didn't like certain things and so they didn't, they didn't write it out. And they presented that as this is what Matthew really wrote or this is what Paul really wrote and it's not true. But anyway, I just threw, I, that was free. I'm not charging you a dime for that piece of information, all right? So anyway, as the truth of Christ is in me, meaning his word, the word of Christ, the Bible is in me, no man shall stop me of this boasting in the regions of Achaia. Wherefore, or why? Because I love you not, God knoweth. But what I do, that I will do, that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion, that wherein they glory, and I have that underlined in bold print, they're up on the screen, that wherein they glory, they may be found even as we. Remember, the false apostles, the deceitful workers, they always want magnification. They want everybody to listen to them, to, uh, to regard them as the mouthpiece of God and nothing else. And so that's what Paul is saying. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. And if you examine that last little statement there, whose end shall be according to their works, you and I are not judged necessarily by our works. We're judged by our faith. Did we trust what God said? That does not apply to those who reject the Bible, reject Christ, reject His atonement, reject the gospel. They absolutely are going to be judged according to their works. They are workers of evil. They're, they're ministers of unrighteousness and they're going to be judged accordingly. So we're taking this idea of for such are false apostles. And we're looking in the Bible at things that are false. Turn to Exodus 23. Things that are false. If you want to do this study on your own, I encourage you to do it. And all you have to do is go to purebiblesearch.com, download Windows, Linux, or Mac, install it on your computer, type in the word false. And you can look at that word all through Scripture. That's what I did. That's what I do. And um, I, I encourage people here a couple of weeks to do that. I've already got some good comments back from people saying, wonderful study. And uh, on your mobile device, if you will go to webchannel.purebiblesearch.com, if you do that on your phone, you can save that as a bookmark to your screen, and it'll work pretty much the same way as the desktop version works. It'll do the counting. If you want to go to a specific chapter in the Bible by number, it'll do that. But it'll, it'll do it through the Internet. So anyway, that's my commercial for the software. Exodus 23, verse 1. Thou shalt not raise a false report. Shalt not raise a false report. Um, hold your place. Turn to Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. So what does that mean? Well, it means what the Bible says. So Isaiah 53, look at verse 1. Who hath believed our report? Okay? And here in Isaiah 53, I get, I get criticized by some, by some people who say that nobody before... Christ came, could be saved, 
the way we're saved because Christ hadn't died yet. But the prophecy of Christ's death and what he suffered is in Isaiah 53. So I say that anybody who read Isaiah 53, the Ethiopian eunuch, in Acts chapter 8, he was reading Isaiah 53. And he didn't understand who that was. And so that's why he asked Philip, is, this, is, he, is Isaiah speaking of himself or some, some other man? And that's when Philip jumped in the chariot and he said, let me show you who this is. And he began to teach to him Jesus Christ. But the Ethiopian eunuch believed. Others have believed Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 is the atonement sacrifice of Christ before it ever happened. So who has believed our report and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? And if you look in verses like uh, verse 4, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we're healed. And so when it says, Thou shalt not raise a false report, back in Exodus 23, the report is the record of the word of God. This is God reporting to us. And Isaiah 53, who hath believed our report, God is then looking for people who believe the gospel, who believe Jesus Christ, who believe in his death on the cross, his resurrection, and so on. God is looking for those people who will believe what God said about Christ, even to the point of him saying it before it ever happened. If you go to chapters like um, Psalm 22, Psalm 22 starts out with, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Well, those are the words that Christ spoke on the cross, but he said it, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, and they didn't understand what he was saying. Had they understood, they would have referenced Psalm 22 in their minds, and they would have said, that's the Messiah, that's what's happening. And in Isaiah 22, it spells out specifically, that they took his garments from him and cast lots for his vesture. That's what the Roman soldiers did on the cross, or at the cross. Um, they pierced his hands and feet. That's exactly what they did to Christ at Calvary, was the Roman soldiers pierced his hands and his feet. Um, they mocked him. That's in, I, that's in Psalm 22. And there's just a whole list of things that David prophesied of Calvary before a thousand years, a thousand years before they happen, the very words of Christ are recorded in Psalm 22 and the actions and the deeds of the Roman soldiers are recorded in Psalm 22, a thousand years before they happen. That's, and, and you believe that. You believe that God gave to David the words to write down a thousand years before they ever happened of the exact events that took place. And anybody reading that a thousand years, three thousand years ago, if they believe that, they believe God's report and they were saved by grace through faith even before Christ actually died on the cross. So, does it matter if the Bible is wrong or not, does it matter? The Bible says, thou shalt not raise a false report. And I'm going to show you some things on the screen here in a little bit. The difference between what the King James says and what the modern translations say. And they, both of them cannot be true. They are contradictory one to the other. And so if one of them is true and one of them's not true, which one do you believe? So, thou shalt not raise a false report. Put not thy hand with the wicked to be an unrighteous witness. Unrighteous witness. Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil, neither shalt thou speak in a cause to decline after many to rest judgment. I think I remember... I, Mentioned that last Sunday during Sunday school. To rest means to twist. Like two wrestlers. They're twisting things. To rest judgment means to twist scripture. Or to twist the words of God. Where they say one thing. And yet you twist them to make them say something entirely different. The difference being. 
If you read the book of Romans in the King James and believe it at face value, you're fine. But if somebody has to come on, as is uh, those who follow the Hebrew Roots movement or the Seventh-day Adventist movement,